was the Messiah. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. In the name of one God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of our lives. Amen. <clears throat> This whole story began with Abraham, when God says to Abraham, I will be your God and you will be my people. And God makes a covenant with Abraham. And it's this covenantal relationship that becomes the paradigm for all of Judaism and for all of the Christian understanding of, of what it means to be in, of a, a people of God in relationship with God. God says, I, I, will, I will make you a holy people, set apart, right? And I will give you this promised land. And the whole history of Israel is the story of how, how they, they, they strive to learn how to be a holy people, how to be God's people in this world, and how they fail at it over and over and over again. And it's a, it's a story of how they, they, they strive to inhabit the land and, and to benefit from the gifts that God gives them in that place. At the time that Jesus and his disciples are, are meeting at the time of our story, the land of Israel is occupied by the Roman Empire. I mean, they're a colony at this point of, of the Roman, and, and, and they don't have a king. Their king is, is Herod, who, who's kind of appointed. They don't have a king that they want as king. They, I mean, their king is, uh, you know, kind of this interloper family uh, that, that is kind of appointed by the Roman authorities. And they have this longing. They have this longing for the restoration. And there's been this kind of the prophets of Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and even Daniel, there were these signs that God was going to do something. That God was going to somehow enter into their experience and, and, and restore, them, restore them to being the kind of people God wants them to be. And their sense was that God would be doing this. God would give us a, a, a good king again like David and that God would restore us as a great nation in the world and that um, all the nations of the earth would bow to our God, Israel. And so there was this messianic expectation among the Jewish people that is there before Jesus even shows up. Before Jesus is even there, it's been, ex it's been in existent for hundreds of years since Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel made these prophecies. And so when Jesus is there with his disciples, you know, they have this expectation of a Messiah. And Jesus takes them to, to the city, Caesarea Philippi, which is about, you know, 40, 50 kilometers north of where they were living in Capernaum. And, you know, it was a Hellenized city. Uh, it was a city that was, there was a, a grotto there that was a shrine to the god Pan. And there were other shrines to the Greek and Roman gods. There were the kinds of things where the Greco-Roman world, you know, were, were manifest in, in this place and time. So Jesus actually takes his disciples out of rural Israel and into this kind of Hellenized city. And there they are standing at the Grotto of Pan and there's this river that runs, this water that just comes out of the rock. It was, you could see why, you know, a people who believed in the, the natural, you know, who, who attributed the gods and gods to the natural world would, would call this a holy place. It was a place where the water came out of the rock, and they thought it was a liminal space between earth and Hades, between the living and the dead. So Jesus takes his disciples there, and they're, they're standing in the midst of, you know, what is a worldly city. It's curious, you, you don't hear Jesus railing against the idolatry of the pagans, which he could have done, which he doesn't do. Um, they're just standing there in the midst of it all. And Jesus says to him, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And the Son of Man is a, a messianic title. He's saying, who do people think the Messiah is? And they're like, well, some people think it was John the Baptist. Some people thought it was Ezekiel. Some people thought it was Jeremiah or some, some of the other prophets. And then Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter's like, well, you're it. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the anointed one, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you. Blessed are you because only God can help you see that. This question, you know, I mean, of who do you say that I am? I mean, even in that moment, I, I think Peter, I think he still has the, the, the Jewish expectation. I think in that moment, he still believes that Jesus is going to be the king, that Jesus is going to be the one that's going to give them political liberation, that Jesus is the one who's going to establish a new kingdom. 
Because we see later, you know, when the soldiers at Gethsemane or the Garden of Gethsemane, when the soldiers are about to take him, Jesus takes out his sword and he cuts off, a, a, you know, he's ready to fight the battle. He cuts off somebody's ear. He's ready to fight the battle because he thinks that Jesus is going to be a king. I don't, I don't think Jesus understands what it means. I don't think Peter understands what it means to be the Christ in that moment. Because what was going to happen is that there was going to be a cross. Like Jesus was going to die. There would be a cross. Jesus would die. And the church believes there was a resurrection. There was an awakening and a, 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 a new birth, a, 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 a breaking in of life into death. And that something happened with, with Jesus that, that brought about a new understanding of what it would mean to be a Messiah, what it would mean to be a Christ. I think we're still trying to figure that out. If I asked you, who do you say that Jesus is, what would you say? I think a lot of us still have this very kind of narrow view that the church kind of, our our view of what it meant for Jesus to be the Christ kind of diminished over time. I mean, I think it was originally very broad. And, um, and, you know, I mean, Paul talks about, you know, Christ, all things being created through Christ, all things being created through the Messiah, and that the Messiah is here to redeem all things and renew all things. I mean, there's this global expectation that God is up to something profound. Fortunately, very often, all we think that what it means to be, for Christ to be the Messiah, or what it means for Christ to be a Savior is that, you know, He saves us from our sins. You know, in a very limited, narrow view, there's the sense that, well, God is mad at us because we're all sinners, and God is ready to consign us all to hell to eternal torment. And so what Jesus does is he comes and he dies in order so that we don't have to, to pay that penalty. And that it's a very thin view of God, right? It's as if what God is up to is really fundamentally sin management. God's sorting out who's been naughty and who's been nice and trying to get the good ones into heaven and everybody else is going to get consigned to hell. I mean, it's unfortunate that Christianity, our, our view of God, had been, has been narrowed in that way in the minds of a lot of people. That's why a lot of people are atheists. Like, I don't buy that. And don't get me wrong. You know, I, I do think that at fun, fundamentally... At some level, understanding, our, understanding sin and understanding grace is central to the Christian faith. Jesus said, you know, the, the summary of the law is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And there are moments where I've experienced love like that, where I've experienced a love that I was able, of, of love of God that felt very profound. And I, I don't know if I've ever attained loving God with my whole heart, mind, and strength, but gosh... I've had moments of profound love there, and I've, I've had profound moments of being able to love my neighbor. And I've even had really good moments of being able to care for myself in a really healthy and positive way. And I've had lots of moments of failure. Like where I haven't loved God with my whole heart, mind, and strength. I haven't even cared about God. Where I've cussed God out, right? I was so angry. And where I haven't, I've profoundly failed my neighbor and haven't loved my neighbor well, and where I haven't loved myself well. I mean, that, that's the definition of sin right there. It's those failures of love. And, you know, my sense is, you know, I don't think God, God I mean, God's heart weeps at those moments, right? God's heart aches at the brokenness of creation in those moments. I, I, I love Psalm 103. I mean, Psalm 103 talks about the heart of God. It says, as far as the east is from the west, God separate God, are our sins from, far from us. For God's mercy is everlasting, and his anger lasts just a moment. Right? This isn't about God's anger. This isn't about trying to appease God's anger. As much as it is God trying to rescue us from those things that that bind us, that, that, that have us enthralled. Like Paul talked about sin, death, and the devil. It's those things that have us in bondage and, and have, keep us from being fully ourselves at some level. So what it means for Jesus to be the Christ is in some sense Jesus frees us. It's, a, it's about our freedom. It's about being released to be able to love more fully. It's about being released to be able to sing more boldly. 
It's about being released to be able to hope even in the midst of t- despair. It's about being able to be released to, feel, to be able to feel joy even in the midst of suffering. That's a much broader vision of what it means to, for Jesus to be the Christ. That we're finally free to fully be the people that God calls us and, and inspires us to be. I mean, at the heart of it is this belief that actually God is good. And that, that God has always longed to be in relationship with God's people. That's what this covenant is all about. That, that God's people matter to God. And, and God is doing everything God can to meet us. Even by, you know, even by entering into the life of Jesus Christ and meeting us in the person of Jesus Christ. Of Jesus, the man of Nazareth, right? Who is also the Christ. But the sense that God embraces our own embodiment. And embraces who we are down to its very level as a way of, of, of calling us more deeply into being the people we are created to be. That's the Christian message. That's the Christian hope. Who do you say that Jesus is? I'm not done answering that question. I, I, I think by spending my life answering that question and being open like discovering actually who Jesus is and, and who Jesus wants to be in my life and, and being open to letting Jesus be the Christ. Amen.